Hello everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. We're big, bad and back for another Fact Friday. Lovely to see you all again. Please hit the like button, share, and of course you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list. You get a whole bunch of free goodies. There's samples, there's free courses, there's all kinds of fun things. And of course, we'll keep you notified on competitions and other free stuff that we're doing. Okay, let's get started with some frequently asked questions. I have tinnitus, and I know a lot of people in the industry like Chris Martin and Will I Am have it too. How do you think I got it? I always mix at low levels. I think this must have happened because I was using passive in-ear headphones in noisy environments like buses, making me turn up the volume. Is there a way to fix tinnitus or will it affect my mixes? It was my wife last week that brought this up. She said, you need to talk about hearing damage, um, about you know protecting your hearing. And this is a great question to sort of get into that. So I'm lucky, so I've got really, really great hearing. I think a lot of it is to do with uh, a focus. Once you've been doing this a long time, you're also able to focus in on sounds and you have that, um, that skill set, which all of you will get and acquire and probably already have. I taught extensively from about the age of 27 to 32. So five years of like touring a lot. And I will say, I didn't always wear earplugs and there was quite a few nights where I came off the stage with my ears ringing. Luckily, not all the time, I started to get used to wearing earplugs, but that, that was really, really dangerous. Once I started working in studios, I liked to listen loud, but I had smart people around me who told me not to listen loud for long periods. All in all, it means I don't have tinnitus. Those that have it have had long-term exposure to high volumes. Maybe as you're saying here, listening to really, really loud music in noisy environments like being on a bus. This is very unfortunate, but as you're pointing out, not uncommon. Actually worked with uh, a very famous guitar player maybe 15, 20 years ago now, and I worked on his record and he only could hear out of one ear. So when we mixed, he would turn the one good ear to the speakers. That's just a reality. He had lost his hearing uh, through a side fill going into massive feedback. So there's all kinds of horrible things. I've worked with legacy artists that have really, have a lack of high frequency hearing. They can't hear this kind of sound, believe it or not. Um, they're above 2K is pretty much gone for them. I, I know that sounds crazy for the younger, younger members out there, but this is very, very common with artists maybe in their mid 60s and 70s that have toured all the way through the 70s and with these huge like monitor systems like just blasting at their head, side fills, you know, Marshall stacks, everything, you know, it, it can really, really damage your hearing. As a producer, an engineer and a mixer, look after your hearing. We talk about it all the time. I will, the dim is my friend. Eric and I will work and we'll have it, you know, we'll have the control set to a nice healthy level, probably just over a third of the potential volume that we could get out of these speakers. But we go in and out of the dim. And occasionally I'll just crank it for a second. We'll listen to something like, you know, a few bars of a song, a chorus, or, or a verse going to chorus, just to hear the impact and make sure it's exciting. Ulrich Wilde talks about that a lot. He says that he listens loud, infrequently, for short periods of time. And I think that's okay. What's going to damage your hearing is sustained high volumes, and particularly sustained bad, distorted high volumes. You know, I was told quite early on when I um, got into PA stuff as, uh, as a teenager in early 20s that square waves going through horns is probably like, the worst thing you could ever do for your hearing. So the reality is, it's like you must look after your hearing. And if you do have tinnitus, it's okay. You know, that light ring will probably annoy the schnizzle out of you, but it won't stop you from working. I can tell you there are lots of, not necessarily older, a lot of them are older, but a lot of guys and girls that do have tinnitus that work at a very, very high level. They've got a workaround. They know how to deal with that ring. And honestly, at a certain volume, it becomes imperceptible when you're working you know, at music. Now, of course, if you do have a massively loud ring, I feel 
you know, really, really feel for you. And I don't know um, how old you are. I don't know any other experiences. But I will tell you, like, you know, like Chris Martin and, as you say, Will I Am, who have that issue, they're still making amazing music. They're still touring. They're still writing, recording. So I don't let any anything like that ever hold you back. But it's never too late, even with tinnitus, for you to protect your hearing. Now that you know what it can do, a little bit of damage, I, I want every single one of you to really look after your ears. Don't listen above 85 dB for sustained periods of time. If you want to crank it for a, you know, the end of a verse into a chorus just to hear the impact, sure, a few seconds of that, great. But try to come down to about 85 dB, which is where we sit on here, and then we just put dim on and off. So basically we just kind of half the volume. And that's great because if I'm doing edits or we're just checking like little, you know, automation parts, you don't need to listen to it blasting. If I've just edited something out or I've automated panned something, it doesn't have to be so loud that it's gonna make my ears bleed. So get used to monitoring at low levels when it's not necessary to listen even at medium level. So you should be able to have like a, a medium level that you're used to a cranked level for a quick test to see if the impact's there, the excitement, and then a sort of diminished level that you can work out just to check moves and stuff. Because to be honest, when I'm listening to tracks and I put it into that low level there, that's the time when I start to hear, is everything sitting properly? Because as we all know the louder it gets, also the sweeter it gets, also the low end starts to come to life. And you start falling in love with that volume, that perceived volume. And then you'll put it back to about 85 dB where everything is even. I feel like I'm doing a four here. Anybody know that? Doing a four? Six? Anyway, so, um, so where everything is even, that is the sweet spot. You want to be living at 85 dB as often as possible. Now, iPhones. Androids, there are apps, there are apps all over the place. I mean, I feel like I wanna go and look now just to prove it. There it is, Spectrum Analyzer, it's a Spectrum Analyzer and a decibel meter. I mean, yeah, and it's free. So download that, download it on your phone. So you can really mix well because you can have a great balance at 85 dB and also, you know, most importantly, protect your ears, protect your hearing. They are the best tools that you have. They're better than any plugins. They're better than anything else. Your best tools are your ears. Protect your hearing. So this is a fantastic uh, question that comes from Ivan Lefeva. Ivan is a Produce Like a Pro Academy member and he asked this question inside of the Academy. So I co-wrote and produced a song that got signed to a sync agency in LA, found out this morning. I'm bouncing a final mix, instrumental mix, TV mix, and an a cappella. My question is, on the instrumental tracks, how much of a difference will it make as far as my master bus compression goes if I just mute the vocal and bounce the instrumental? I've heard that people will bounce the mix and sidechain the bounce mix back into when bouncing instrumental, so you're getting the same amount of compression and it's not bringing anything else up. If it does make a difference, how do you properly set that up in Pro Tools? Makes me think of two completely different stories here. So you, we all know Matt Squire, the producer, very talented guy, uh, drummer, did a ton of, I think he did Panic at the Disco and a whole bunch of incredible records and uh, loads, loads of great stuff. And I was a staff producer on X Factor, the TV show for a couple of years and he was one of the producers. And he said to me that he had an SSL and he used to mix and produce everything through his SSL. He made stems just through the bus compressor as it was, made the stems, was in a hotel or something and he was asked to reproduce the mix. So he took the stems, which didn't have anything clever done to them, and summed them together, rebalanced, you know, muted something or whatever the label were asking, and then rebounced it. And he said, honestly, he said, it sounded better. He said it sounded fuller and better than when the whole mix was summed going through the master bus. So that's one thing I would think about. And after that, he said he started then mixing more in the box, you know, processing things, but mixing more in the box and keeping it more 
you know, in a stereo. And just to be honest, that's also what Reed does a lot of. Reed does a lot of stuff coming through the SSL channel and then prints them into his session and then manipulates them from there. And even I even think of stuff I used to do with a, quite a few other producers when I just used to engineer. We would print stems and then do mixes from stems. There's something very inherently great about going through channels and bus compression, even lightly, and then re-blending it. But Ivan's question is a bit bigger than that. Those of you who've been watching for the last couple of years, so now, uh, four or five years since we started, will remember a couple of years ago, we did a really great interview with Ben Gross, who's an incredible producer, engineer, and mixer. He's mixed a lot of incredible records, some huge rock albums. And he's an SSL guy, so he's got the bus compression and everything. And he brought that up and he said exactly what you're talking about, Ivan. So you would print your mix without anything on the master bus and then put it to the side, say the other side of your master bus, just imagine it on the other side, and then feed that into the side chain compressor of your compression. So no matter what you put through, it would always be listening to the full mix with the vocals. And I think it's a, not a bad idea. I'm very tempted to sort of suggest you do both and see what you prefer, depending on how many stems you make. But it is interesting, of course, because it will like gently duck the whole mix when the vocal's loud, even though the vocal won't be in the instrumental. So I'm a little intrigued to see how that really works and how it sums back together. So once more, just to explain it really simply, bounce your homix, bounce it with nothing on the master bus. So it's just like it was going through the first compressor of the master bus, but it's all turned off. Put that to the one side of, of the master bus so you don't confuse yourself. Side chain that, so go to your compressor, your stereo compressor and choose a stereo option for a side chain. So it's going to read the outputs that you assign for the mix. So let's just say you use 77 and 78 as the outputs. The side chain will be reading 77 and 78. You don't have to touch any settings. You're gonna leave all the settings exactly the same. That will exactly give you the same compression and EQ and et cetera, et cetera, that you've been getting before. But as you mentioned, you can now bounce it without the vocals in it and the compression will be controlled by this other track. It's gonna be interesting, but yes, Ivan, that is how uh, Ben Gross said he did it on the SSL. So he would take that, I'm sure he would just have a way of feeding it in separately, probably from, probably from Pro Tools, but yes, he would, he would have that mix side chaining that whole compression. Very interesting technique, indeed. I play a Les Paul and changed out the pickups to Demacio Virtual Hot Path and I play a Blackstar ID Core 40 and an ID Core 20 for practice in my bedroom. I feel I'm not getting the sound I want because it's not a tube amp. What would you recommend for pickups for the Les Paul? And I'm thinking about buying a nice new tube amp and what would you recommend? The players I like are Ace Freely from Kiss and Mick Ralph from Bad Company. Obviously, if you're going for Dimarzio, you're on the right path for Ace. Ace uses very famously, of course, the super distortion pickups that Dimarzio made, and they sound fantastic. When I was a kid, that was the first guitar pickup I ever remember people would talk about, the, the Dimarzios. Having said that, you know my favorite combination of pickups, and many, many, many people's favorite combination of pickups, of course, is the Jeff Beck humbucker with the jazz pickup on the front. Those, it's, it's called the JB, but the Jeff Beck pickup. Those two pickups, to me are like the ultimate combination of pickups. But if you like um, Ace Freely, yeah, stick with the um, DiMarzio. It does seem like to me you've made a choice of DiMarzio pickups, and you're probably right, almost certain, it's the amp that needs to have that sound. Now, bear in mind, Ace always played through and always has played through Marshalls. And Blackstar make incredible amps, so don't get me wrong, I'm not going to knock Blackstar. I don't have one, but I have a lot of Marshalls, PV, the EVH, the Mesa, the Engels, the Laney, a Vox, and we have more amps coming any day, I think another seven from Glenn. So this is gonna be amptastic in here. Honestly, if you want the sound of a Marshall with DiMarzio pickups on it, of Kiss, 
you should probably get a Marshall. Whenever I tracked Ace here and I've done three albums with him and we did loads of guitars here, him and Slash, as you know, play together here. All Marshalls, Marshall, Marshall, Marshalls. It's just, it's inherent in Ace's sound. I think so many players grew up loving Clapton's Blues Breaker album where it's a Les Paul through, you know, the Blues Breaker combo, the 212, I think it's a 45 watt or 50, yeah, 45 watt Marshall combo. And then of course, all the rest of us love Jimi Hendrix for those Marshall stacks. So yeah, I think that might be your secret. I would say, firstly, yes, definitely upgrade your amp to a tube amp, preferably a Marshall as Ace is your favorite guitar player or one of your favorite guitar players. I'm sure Mick Rouse at most of his career played for a Marshall as well. But regardless, that seems like the number one solution. But you know, the best, the best pickups are, everybody makes great pickups now. Everybody makes great pickups. There's some really incredible solutions. But you know, change the amp first. I think that's gonna be the biggest difference that you're gonna feel. You change the amp, you get the Marshall, you get that Marshall sound, and I think you'll be very, very happy. Well, what a wonderful week. Thank you ever so much. Remember, protect your ears, look after your hearing. These are the best tools you have. So please look after your hearing. We just measured 85 dB on a, um, I'll show you which app I got. DB meter, up there. We turned up the speakers until we got to 85 dB and it was actually quite considerably loud. So, you know, 85 dB is not a quiet listening position. So I think even working at 85, you know, we work less than that. We'll crank it up a little bit, but when we were playing back, it was pretty darn loud. So my point is, is like, don't work any louder than that, except for very, very short periods of time. And then try to use that dim or find a place you mark off on the master volume control so that you're not blowing your head off all the time, especially when you're doing editing and you're doing panning stuff and automation and mutes. You don't need to be listening to it cranking to check the low end when you know, you're doing fiddly little bits and pieces. So protect your hearing. Once again, best tools you have. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Thank you ever so much for tuning in for another week. Look forward to seeing you next week. Cheery bye.